With a cheap serial adapter and the world's ugliest solder job, you can access a secret diagnostics mode that has been hidden from you for nearly 10 years. These diagnostics can be used to deny warranty claims, but nobody outside of Milwaukee could read them until now. Today, we are leveling the playing field and giving you, the owner of the battery, access to these deep diagnostics. I'm going to show you how we cracked their access code and the testing we had to do to decipher what we found. You may have seen the flash code trick that was revealed by myself and tools and stuff last year. Well, you can get rid of that because counting flashes is for peasants. We're making a giant leap forward to the 1970s and using UART communication, which uses a sequence of high and low voltages to represent a number. Each byte is a number between 0 and 255, and you need to send exactly the right sequence of numbers to get the battery to spill its secrets. Whilst the flash codes only gave us number of charges and days since first charge, these secret codes give us so much more. Currently, if you wanted to check cell balance to see if it was worth warranting your battery, you have to take the battery apart, measure the cells, write them down. Like a peasant. But now, in a matter of seconds, we can get all five cell voltages with millivolt accuracy. We can also see how many times a battery has been overheated, overloaded, total discharge in amp hours, and much more. We can even write messages for Milwaukee to read when we have to warranty our imbalanced batteries. This has been a huge project that's involved hundreds of hours of work from multiple people across the globe. We've been working on this in the background for nearly a year, and we're excited to finally make these hidden codes available to everyone. If you want to follow along at home, all you need is a USB to serial adapter and a level shifter to boost the 3 volt signal up to 8 volts or higher. You don't have to recreate my bodgy soldering job as you can just buy a cheap level shifting board. So now that we have a device to send signals to the battery, where do we even begin to find the right sequence of numbers to send? Well, it started with a YouTuber called Buy It Fix It, who eavesdropped on the communication between M18 batteries and the charger. He posted some of the charging messages and deduced that the last two numbers were the sum of all the others, which is known as a checksum. Six months later, I took what he had published and threw my giant pile of batteries at the problem. I further refined the structure of the message by identifying a three byte header, consisting of a command byte, a debugging byte, and the length of the payload. So we now know how to construct a message that the battery will recognize, we just have to figure out what command code to use and what payload to send. Then about a year ago, I got contacted by Martin Jansson. Martin and another guy called Topper had worked together to get access to a similar system in Makita batteries, and Martin had even figured out a way to unlock bricked batteries. They were able to recreate the M18 charging protocol and trick a battery into thinking it was being charged. Using their deep knowledge of embedded systems, they were able to make some educated guesses as to the structure of the diagnostics code. After much trial and error, they eventually got a battery to respond to the following command. The command code is 01, and the payload is two bytes that refer to an address, then another byte to specify how many numbers we want to read. Some of the data is quite strict and acts like a register where you need to provide the exact address and the exact length. Other parts act more like memory and allow you to choose any address and length as long as they're within the memory block. Seems pretty simple, but it took a lot of effort to get to this point. Now that the message format had been cracked, Martin wrote a script to brute force check every address. He found the following data and was able to identify cell voltages, temperature, number of charges, and more. What's especially impressive about what Martin discovered is that he doesn't have any Milwaukee tools or chargers, just a handful of broken batteries. Martin and Topper solved the hardest part of this problem, and without them it would have taken me years to get to this point. Now it was time for me to do what I do best and throw my stockpile of M18 batteries at the problem and make giant colourful spreadsheets. I also ran the brute force script on my new Forge battery to see if there was any new data. After 16 hours of trying 655,000 different combinations, I found 13 new registers. The first step in deciphering was to dump the diagnostics from all of my batteries. Of my 19 batteries, 14 returned diagnostics codes. All of my batteries from 2016 onwards had diagnostics, and I believe any battery with this Wi-Fi looking symbol will work. Forge batteries no longer have the symbol, but they definitely have diagnostics. Now that we've got a giant wall of numbers, 442 per battery to be precise, how do we even begin to make any sense of it? Well, first we look for numbers that are common across all batteries. Then we look for numbers that only change between different types of batteries. Then we can try grouping bytes into one, two, and four byte words. The one byte words can be converted to ASCII, which quickly reveals this string of letters. Four byte words can be displayed as a date, known as Unix time, and anything close to the age of the battery is a good candidate to be a date register. 
Then, for a good chunk of the data, we see alternating rows of small and large numbers, and we can be fairly confident that they are 2-byte words. A few of the numbers are quite obvious. This block of 10 bytes is clearly 5 2-byte words of similar value, and their integer value is the cell voltages in millivolts. We haven't been able to find the serial number, but we're pretty sure it's in this 5-byte register. The first 2 bytes are common with the battery type, then we think the next 3 bytes are a serial number. But no matter how we dice them, we can't find a formula to convert it to what is on the case. Our thinking is that they have a case serial number and an electronic serial number that get linked together at the factory. Now, looking at static data can only get us so far. So we take a battery, charge it, discharge it, poke it with a stick, heat it up, pull 300 amps from it, and just generally abuse it. Obviously in a systematic and scientific way. I'm not just doing this for fun. Between each test, we dump all the diagnostics and add them to a new column and auto-highlight any values that change. I ended up doing over 200 tests across these three batteries, and reading back the notes tells the story of my descent into madness. There were several gotchas in early testing that hindered progress. One of the biggest is that M18 batteries and chargers from before 2015 use an older charging protocol. It involves just putting a high voltage on the J2 pin, which my POVO setup would often do when the pins didn't align properly. So I was getting a lot of unexpected increases in the charge count. This ended up being kind of helpful as it turns out they keep separate charging stats for what we've been calling red link charges and dumb charges. So we quickly found numbers for red link charge count and dumb charge count, which when added together gave the total charge count. The second gotcha is that many of the dates get rounded down to the same time, so you have to wait until the internal clock goes past midnight before you'll see changes in the registers that log date of last charge and date of last tool use. The third gotcha is that they don't record any discharge stats until the discharge current is around 10 amps. So lots of our early tests were really confusing as overheating the battery, free spinning a tool or discharging on a 7 amp load weren't giving us anything. It's a bit strange that they don't record overheat unless the battery is drawing 10 amps. I can trick the battery into thinking it is overheated, but it won't record that fact unless it's on a charger or drawing more than 10 amps. That's definitely something I'd be recording in the event that someone left their battery in a hot car or similar. The final gotcha that wasted hours of my life is that some of the diagnostics values only get refreshed after they are read. So I would do an action and note that it had changed a register, but then when I repeated the action, sometimes I'd no longer see a change. It's very hard to find cause and effect when the effect isn't seen until the next action. Eventually I figured it out and our script now forces a read of all the registers before going through them again and printing them out. One of my first tests was running my vacuum on high and low. Low is around 10 amps and high is 18 and a half amps. The first thing I noticed was that running the tool at 10 amps for 5 seconds was increasing this register by 50. Then running it at 18 and a half amps for 5 seconds was increasing it by 90. Further testing confirmed it as a Coulomb counter, which records the total amount of amp seconds discharged by the battery. We can convert amp seconds to amp hours and calculate how many full discharge cycles each battery has done. This is a much better metric for the wear and tear on a battery than the number of times it was put on a charger. I also noticed the next register increasing in a similar pattern but with much higher numbers. Dividing them revealed the second register is multiplied by the pack voltage, so it is measuring total watt seconds, which we can convert to watt hours. Further down our list was something even more interesting. 10 amp runs increased this register by the number of seconds the tool was on, whilst 18 and a half amp runs increased the next register. I used my angle grinder to hold the battery at higher currents, and it revealed that they're storing total discharge time in roughly 10 amp buckets. Needing a more controlled way to discharge high currents, I built my Mark II version of the Scumbag Variable Resistor. I probably should have made it longer, as the minimum current I could draw was 100 amps. Fortunately, these new tabless batteries laugh in the face of 100 amps. I got a little too eager to see how high these buckets could go, so I shortened the current path a little too much. And we're going to give her a little bit more this time. Let's see what this gives us. Whoa! That gives us a lot. That was 300 amps, I think. Whoa. 
So 340 amps is a bit extreme, but the forge took it like a champ. We see the cool ohm counter increasing by 320 amp seconds, as we'd expect, and this register going from 0 to 1. All of my other batteries have a 0 here, so this is probably an overcurrent or even short circuit register. I might have to figure out how to erase this if I ever need to warranty this battery. I did a few more tests until my Constantin wire had been abused too much and lost its constant resistance properties. So that was 100 amps, about there, that was 300 amps. Let's try something a little less crazy. I'm going to try and get 150. One, two, three. Last one. I'm going to go for 200 amps. Fortunately, I have nice little burn marks to tell me where I've already tested. Like 100, 120, that was 140, 150 to 140, that was 300. Let's count to three. One, two, three. Hmm, that was all over the shop. I think the highest bucket is 200 amps, but I'm going to need better equipment to confirm. There's another set of discharge buckets that's more fine grained and seems to be every 5 amps. I suspect this is in watts, which would be 100 watt buckets, but again, I need better equipment. This data is great because you can construct a histogram of how badly you've abused your batteries. It's not too surprising that 20 to 30 amps is the most common range across all my batteries. The next big discovery was when I was looking at what I thought was a charge counter, but sometimes the next register would increase instead. Checking my notes made me suspect that they may have another set of buckets for charge duration, and a few simulated charges revealed them to be exactly that. I thought the interval would be something sensible, like 15 minutes, but testing revealed it was larger. So then I bracketed around 1000 seconds, but it was still larger. Turns out the interval is 1024 seconds, which is a convenient number in binary, but not really necessary when this chip is more than capable of dividing by 900. I also tested the dumb charge times, and they had a separate set of buckets. I foolishly thought this would be easy, as surely they would use 1024 seconds again, but no. And this is where I nearly went insane as I spent the best part of a day bracketing the interval down to the apparently random 873 seconds. I have no idea why they would choose that number, it makes no sense to me at all. During my bracketing of the charge time buckets, I noticed a pattern where these registers would increase in the morning, but after midday, it would be the next register that increased. I had been recording room temperature in my notes, which got me thinking they could be buckets for charging temperature. So I hooked up a variable resistor in parallel with the thermistor to trick the battery into thinking it was at a higher temperature. Lo and behold, we see the counters moving to the next register as I increase the temperature. Then I noticed there was another set of registers doing the same thing, so I did a test by starting the battery at 78 Celsius, then turning it down to 42 Celsius before stopping the charge. Obviously, the first set of buckets are the starting temperature, and the second set are end of charge temperature. One weird thing is that they don't actually record overheating events during charge. The only way they can tell is with the start and end of charge temperature buckets. So just quietly, if your battery overheats mid-charge, just let it cool down before taking it off and Milwaukee will never know. I noticed another chunk of data that seemed to be bucketed and seemed to be counting charges. I had an idea that it might be voltage when put on the charger, and Martin came in clutch here as he has his PCBs set up with resistors to spoof the voltages. So he could easily test different start and end voltages and quickly confirm that these were start and end of charge voltage buckets. The overheat on a tool counter eluded us for a while, but once we figured out that you need to be discharging at at least 10 amps, it was an easy find. There's two registers that record low voltage events, but in slightly different ways. This one always has the largest number, as it records any time that any cell drops below the low voltage threshold. This happens a lot, as any high current use causes the voltage to sag, but as soon as the tool shuts off, the voltage rebounds and you can use the tool again. When you hit the low voltage cutoff and the voltage doesn't rebound enough, the battery considers itself empty and will soft lock itself until you put it on a charger. Doing that increases both the low voltage register as well as this register, which counts number of times the battery was discharged to empty. This register is what Milwaukee calls excessive current. I know this because the only way I can increase this register is to get four flashing lights, which is described in their user manual as excessive current draw. 
but my 300 amp test on my forge battery did not change this register. The only way I've been able to change this register is by holding the tool right at the limit of low voltage cutoff. You'll notice the stuttering that happens because the low voltage cutoff keeps bouncing on and off. There we go. The only battery that I can achieve this with is the 2 amp hour, although apparently I've done it 4 times on one of my 5 amp hour packs. I think this is measuring sustained low voltage bounce rather than overcurrent, but again I'd need better equipment to be sure. So we found 442 bytes which we're pretty sure represents 184 registers of diagnostic data, and so far we've managed to decipher 151 of them. Now let's use these diagnostics to help all of the M18 users out there. We wrote a function to give you a simple health report on your battery, including cell imbalance, total discharge cycles, and even prints a simple histogram of discharge current. There's also a function to submit your diagnostics data to us, which will help us decipher the unknown diagnostics code. If you want to go fancier, you can dump all the diagnostics in spreadsheet form, then copy and paste them across. This lets you take a snapshot of your battery every day, week, month, whatever. Then you can see how quickly your batteries are becoming imbalanced and whether you should try and warranty them. You can see from my batteries that most have less than 10 millivolts of imbalance. And check out this 5 amp hour. 7 years since first charge, 18 hours of trigger time, 32 minutes of which was over 100 amps, and it's had 309 amp hours discharged or 61 full cycles. And all of the cells are still within 4 millivolts. My 2 amp hour packs are not great with 70 and 30 millivolts of imbalance, but these small packs tend to get pushed harder relative to their size. My 8 and 12 amp hour packs, which are the most unreliable of the M18 line, are pretty bad. Mostly 500 millivolt imbalance after just 5.5 years. They've also only had around 15 full discharge cycles. But then one of my 12 amp hour packs only has 8 millivolts imbalance, despite being used nearly twice as much as the others. So that's a good example of how cell quality affects the longevity of these packs when they don't have cell balancing. In my opinion, anything over 30 millivolt imbalance is worthy of warranting, with exceptions of course for heavy use. Milwaukee may disagree, but now with this tool, we've at least got access to the same info as they do.